excerpt from the book Klondike Fever by Pierre Burton. It's 1898, and a city named Dawson has sprung up on the flat and marshy edge of the Klondike River where it meets the Yukon. The former Moose Pasture is a bustling, crowded town jammed full of 30,000 Argonauts. We pick up the story on page 315. All these proceedings were watched curiously and with a certain genteel detachment by two wealthy ladies who appeared briefly upon the scene in July. These were the first two bona fide tourists to reach Dawson, and with their advent, the community might be said to have arrived. One was Mrs. Mary E. Hitchcock, the widow of a U.S. Admiral. Her companion was Miss Edith Van Buren, the niece of the former U.S. President. It was the habit of this pair to visit various watering places and points of interest each summer, and this particular summer, rather than Paris, Bath, or Shanghai, they had chosen Dawson City, for it seemed the most interesting place to go. Of all the thousands who poured into the Klondike that season, it is probable that these two were the only ones who came merely as sightseers. They had brought with them what a fellow traveler described as, quote, the strangest conglomeration of cargo that ever women and wit devised, end quote. It included, get ready for this, two Great Danes, an ice cream freezer, a parrot, several canaries, two cages full of live pigeons, a gramophone, a hundred pound criterion music box, a coal oil stove, a zither, a portable bowling alley, a primitive motion picture projector, a mandolin, several air mattresses and hammocks, and box after box of rare foods, pate and truffles, stuffed olives and oysters. This vast cargo was transported ported some 5,000 miles by water to the accompaniment of the tart tongue and hot temper of Mrs. Hitchcock, the buxom matron who was in charge of the expedition and who complained incessantly about the freight charges on the steamboat that brought them from St. Michael. She had not been used to this when crossing the Atlantic. The most singular item was an enormous marquee tent, which covered 2,800 square feet and was the largest ever brought into the Yukon Territory. There was no space for it in the main town, so the ladies had it raised on the bank on the far side of the Yukon River, where it dominated the landscape. It was so cavernous that they soon found it expedient to pitch a, another, smaller tent in one quarter in order to keep warm at night. Soon, this extraordinary couple were to be seen walking the duckboards of Dawson in their tailored suits, their starched collars, their boater hats, and their silk ties. Occasionally, they affected a more picturesque garb, large sombreros, blue serge knickers, rubber boots, striped jersey sweaters, and heavy cartridge belts to which were strapped impossibly big revolvers. In their gargantuan marquee, the two ladies held court. They searched about the town for the right people and quickly sensed that the leader of Dawson's 400 was big Alex MacDonald. He became guest of honor at intimate little dinners within the great tent. The menu included anchovies, mock turtle soup, roast mousse, escalloped tomatoes, asparagus salad with French dressing, peach ice cream, chocolate cake, and French drip coffee. Indeed, the bounty of the ladies' board made the Regina Cafe seem like a one-armed joint. Both were large of girth, and having heard tales of the Klondike starvation winter, had no intention of going hungry. Their memoirs, while somewhat vague on the specifics of the gold rush, are peppered with detailed accounts of what they consumed daily, down to the last crisp potato ball. Here on this frozen strip of riverbank, they observed the niceties of Philadelphia and Washington. One physician who had known Miss Van Buren's father in Yokohama expressed a desire to call, but sent his card saying that he would be unable to do so since he would not, could not procure a starch shirt. She graciously accepted his excuse, waived all formality, and received him anyway in his serge suit. The Salvation Army, meanwhile, had dispatched a troop to Dawson 
and these bonneted servants of the Lord, covetously eyeing the marquee, summon up courage to ask the ladies if they might use it for their Sunday service. The ladies were happy to oblige. The following Sabbath, as the voices were raised in prayer, it was noticed that the pigeons had escaped from their cages and were fluttering about the heads of the uneasy congregation. One of them finally perched on the music box, which mechanically responded with, Nearer my God to thee, and the entire assemblage rose and repeated the grand old hymn which they had already sung. Mrs. Hitchcock and Miss Van Buren stayed out the summer and then booked passage upriver on the tiny little steamer Flora. They were shocked by the primitive stateroom to which they were assigned. There was only a one-foot space to turn around in between the double bunks and the wall, and it was quite impracticable to undress save for the removal of an overcoat or so. Nor were there any washing facilities except for a bucket with a rope attached to it, which one had to lower over the side and into the muddy river. As the boat departed, the two outraged women could be heard complaining shrilly about these arrangements. It wasn't at all what they were used to, really. <laughs>